reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. When John the Baptist heard in prison of the works of the Christ, he sent his disciples to Jesus with this question. Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? Jesus said to them in reply, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind regain their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the good news proclaimed to them. And blessed is the one who takes no offense at me. As they were going off, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out to the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? Then what did you go out to see? Someone dressed in fine clothing? Those who wear fine clothing are in royal palaces. Then why did you go out? To see a prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way before you. Amen, I say to you, among those born of women, there has been none greater than John the Baptist. Yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. The Gospel of the Lord. Tonight I want to uh, reflect with you all about the interaction and the kind of the relationship between faith and doubt. Faith and doubt. It's a really important uh, relationship. It's an important dynamic in our lives. So I don't have much experience from the female side of this, hard to believe. Um, but I want to start, I want you to think back about romantic relationships. And particularly when you're about to ask someone out. There's almost nothing scarier for a guy than that. At least as far as I remember, it's been a little while since that happened for me. But back when I was on the market, yes, I was on the market at one point. Um, didn't go so well. But... Um, <laughs> It's really nerve-wracking to ask out a woman. It touches all of your insecurities, and you have to kind of put yourself out there. And so what men tend to do, and it's one of our weaknesses, is that we want certainty. And guys, I'm sure you've done this. Maybe some of you were, were much better at this than I was. But I always wanted certainty. When I was going to ask a girl out, I was so nervous about it, I wanted to know ahead of time what the answer would be. And guys have kind of strange ways of doing that, right? Um, mostly it involves kind of like juvenile flirtation, which I still see a lot in adult communities. It's kind of fun to watch sometimes. <laughs> um, but guys, we know this, right? There's a way of kind of trying to figure out if a girl likes you before you ask her out. And then you can go even further with that, with the big question, right, is when couples are dating, and if you're getting towards that engagement question. You want that level of certainty. But what makes romance so wonderful and so difficult all at once is that it's never certain. It's the nature of romance. And that's why we both love it and struggle so much with it. Women, on the other hand, I think, ladies, you can correct me after Mass, no one has yet today, so you could be the first. But I think what women want is they want something of the opposite. Women, the, the women that I know, they want men to pursue them, and they want them to take a risk. Right? There's something so wonderful when you see someone who, who can t step out and say, I don't know for sure, but I'll take a chance. I'll put myself out there. And women find that very attractive. There's something deeply masculine about that. 
A lot of our life reflects that dynamic. As human beings, what we want is we want certainty. I have a lot of people who speak to me and they say, Father Brian, I will do what God wants me to do. I just want to know two things. I want to be sure that Jesus really is God. And I just want him to tell me exactly what he wants. Have you ever thought that? It doesn't work that way. <laughs> I wish it did. It doesn't. You see, because God's a lover. He doesn't give us certainty. And why is that? He wants not just your minds, and that is important, that's, that's worth saying. That doesn't mean we have a blind leap of faith as Christians. There are important questions we have, and there are even better answers. But God's not a math problem to be solved. And faith is not a calculation. Faith is a surrender of your life. That's what it means to be a person of faith. God doesn't just want your mind or your time. He wants your heart. He wants you to be that person who says, you know what, Lord, I don't have all the answers, but there's something so beautiful and compelling about you that I will risk myself. I'll step out of my comfort zone because it's worth it. That's faith. And that's so important. Now what I want to get at tonight is that so oftentimes people say to me, that, and frequently it'll happen in the confessional, people will tell me, Father Brian, I, I feel like I've sinned because I have doubts. And I think we get so scared as Christians about having doubts because we think we're supposed to be certain. But the nature of faith, brothers and sisters, is that it's going to demand something of you in trust, in fidelity, and in love when you don't have all the answers. So I'm going to tell you tonight, one of the most important things I think that can happen to you as a Christian is I actually think it's really important that you have doubts at different time, times in your Christian life. Yes, I said that, and I know half of you, you'll go home and you'll, that's the only thing you'll remember, right? It's people that your family say, what did Father Brian preach about? And you say, oh, he, he told us the faith is all a bunch of lies. Um, I didn't say that, okay? <laughs> Listen to the rest of the sermon. Doubts are part of being human. If you've never doubted your faith, I doubt if you have ever risked something. We tend to doubt things when we risk something real for our faith. And the reason I'm bringing this up tonight is because of our gospel. In our gospel tonight, we are in Matthew chapter 11. In, in his gospel, there's 28 chapters. And so we're, we're a good ways in. But back all the way in chapter 3, and you know the story, in chapter 3, Jesus comes to John the Baptist to be baptized. And at that moment, John is supremely confident about who Jesus is. It's obvious to him that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Son of God. When Jesus comes to be baptized, John says to him, Lord, I can't baptize you. I need to be baptized by you. But here we are in chapter 11, and it seems like John has lost some of that. And that's an important thing to just say. Sometimes in your Christian life, you're going to hit dark times. And that's okay. Brothers and sisters, in my own faith, there have been probably five or six times in a very serious way where I've been hurting and I've had to turn to God and say, Lord, is this real? I've pursued you. I've failed most of the time. I, I've, I've tried, though. Am I giving my life for something that's just kind of wishful thinking? The people who do that, and if they engage, if they open their hearts to God, and if they go looking for answers, and that's the key. You can't just be passive about it. You have to open your heart to God 
And you have to turn to the right sources. I always laugh. I always think a lot of times people, when they encounter difficulties in their faith and they don't know the answers, they turn to their neighbor who used to go to church. And like, tell me what you think about this. They're like, oh yeah, that Catholicism, it's all just a bunch of rules. That's a great source, right? <laughs> now you have to go to the right sources. And brothers and sisters, when you do that, the people who do that, the people who risk something, the people who go through doubts and difficult times and engage in the right way, you know who those people are? They're the strongest Catholics in our church. Because they take it seriously. And they find out that there are great questions, but there's even better answers. Answers that will speak to your mind and to your heart. So back to John. So we're in Matthew 11, and John says this. See, earlier on, he had such confidence about who Jesus was. But tonight in our gospel, John says, it says that John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ. He sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you he who is to come, or shall we look for another? John had doubts. He was at this moment in his life where he says, I thought Jesus was the one, the Messiah that would redeem Israel. And now he's questioning. Lord, are you really the one? And John had good reason to, to doubt. Uh, you might ask, why is he doing that now, right? All these miracles are happening. If you heard in our gospel, Jesus tells the disciples of John the Baptist, the blind are having their sight restored. Deaf people are hearing. The poor are having good news preached to them, and even dead people are being raised to life. So how could John doubt? And by the way, those things are quotations of our first reading from Isaiah 35. Isaiah says, when the Messiah comes, here's what it's going to look like. But here's why I think John doubted. In Isaiah, there's a number of prophecies about when, when the Messiah comes, here's what's going to happen. And at the end of Isaiah's book, in chapter 61, there's another prophecy about when the Messiah comes. And Jesus quotes this line in his very first sermon in Luke chapter 4. But here's what Isaiah says. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. Anointed is the word that means Messiah. It is Messiah in Hebrew. The Lord has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. And listen to this. To proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. John the Baptist knew this. And all the other things are happening, and John sits in prison. And he'll never leave that prison, by the way. Shortly after our gospel tonight, John the Baptist will be beheaded as a witness and a martyr for the dignity of marriage. What does that say to us tonight? You and I, when we go through doubts, the first thing, brothers and sisters, we tend to doubt when we're in pain, when we're hurting. And you'll have that in your life. You're going to have moments where things go wrong and you say, Lord, why are these great things happening for other people but not for me? And there's going to be a natural temptation to doubt. And you could run at that point or you could engage. But here's the second point. Here's the secret, I think, of understanding why John did not despair. Why Jesus tonight, in fact, calls him the greatest of all the prophets. And here's the secret. And let me tell you a story first. So this is a recycled story for those of you who came to our Advent retreat. Don't judge me. Um, it's hard to come up with stories all the time. <laughs> But a week and a half ago, roughly, maybe two weeks ago now, um, I got a haircut. It's hard to notice because I know my hair isn't what it used to be. Um, 
But I got a haircut and I went to this place pretty close by and I walked in in my collar. And the woman who was working got really excited. And so I was like, okay, she's certainly Catholic. And she was. She was a, a Vietnamese woman. And you just, as a priest, you just never know how these things are going to go. It's like, all right, here we go, Lord. What is this going to be about? And she was wonderful. And she actually, if those of you who know Monsignor Kwong, she reminded me of Monsignor Kwong because she has a similar story. She escaped Vietnam as a, a, a refugee and on a boat, and her boat was attacked and all these things. But she had a wonderful faith. But there was this really interesting moment that came up. She said, Father Brian, my brother lost his faith. And he lost his faith because God didn't answer his prayer. He was hurting. And God didn't hear his prayer. And she said the, the funniest thing to me. She turned to me and she said, she said, I told him, look at how many people there are in the world. God doesn't have time for your prayer. <laughs> right? And I, and I, she was thought for sure I would agree with that. And she had scissors in my head, so I just kind of laughed and said, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> And it was, she said the most wonderful thing she said. She said, I told him, God, it takes two to three years. Two to three years. You wait two to three years, then God hears your prayer. All right, that's how long it takes because there's a lot of people. And I just kind of smiled and nodded. I said, uh-huh, two to three years. How long have I been praying for help at the parish? Not long <laughs> enough yet. But here's my point. Why, did, why could John suffer? This woman, with, she had a wonderful faith, but she has it backwards. Our problem is not that our prayers are too big. It's that they're far too small. That's the problem. And here's what I mean by that. When you and I pray, what we tend to pray for is, Lord, help my life to go well. I want, you know, to be secure. I want to be healthy. I want things to go well. And that's not a bad prayer. But what God wants to do for you in your life is he wants you to look like his son. He wants to mold you and shape you so that your concern is a little bit less about your life and it's a little bit more about the salvation of the world. And I believe that's why John could stay in prison and why he could suffer. Because John's heart and his hope was not for his own life. And we know this from other parts of the gospel. John's hope was for the redemption of Israel. And that's what God wants to do for us. Brothers and sisters, when I suffer, I do the same thing. I say, Lord, I'm your priest. My life is supposed to be easy. Right? Remember this? And he laughs at me. But what he's doing in me slowly, I hope, is that he's training me to hope for something bigger. That I can lose my story, I can let go of my story of Brian Larkin's happiness, I can let go of that if I'm a part of a bigger story. Right? If my life is a part of the solution to the problems in the world that God is working to fix. That's what God wants to do. And so brothers and sisters, there's just two points tonight, remember. The first one is okay to doubt if you wrestle with it the right way. It's okay. But you'll have a stronger faith because of it. But through the midst of that doubt and through the midst of difficulties and trials and sufferings, God wants to remake you. He wants you to be a little bit less like everybody else and a little bit more like Jesus. Right? Someone whose hope and whose faith is not about my life going well. It's about the salvation of the world. 
And so Jesus, tonight, Lord, help us to let go of our fears. Help us to let go of our love for ourselves. Lord, when we doubt, may we encounter you. May you walk with us. Jesus, more than anything tonight, we ask you for that beautiful, amazing, and powerful gift. We ask you for the gift of faith.